Okay, so as you probably guessed, today we're going to be looking at power systems. And we've got a few answers there. Um, I think I, I changed the question a little bit halfway through, so what and why? But I guess we'll answer those today anyway as well. But, I mean, some mostly pretty sensible answers there. Everything, pretty much on board a satellite, needs power. So we need to have some way to raise this power on our satellite to be able to give all of the systems that need power, even propulsion, even chemical thrusters need power. If you've got valves and things you need to control, and sensors on board just to see what's going on in the propulsion system. So pretty much every system, perhaps not structures, but pretty much every other system on board a satellite, if it's active or if it's semi-active, it will need power. So we need to have some way of getting that to the spacecraft. Um, so let me just try and... Okay. So, you've done the first uh, nine sections in this course. We've gone all the way up to thermal last week. Uh, today we're going to be covering... This week, sorry. And today we're going to be covering the power system. And then next week uh, and the week after, we'll cover comms and attitude determination. So we're almost getting towards the end. And we're at a very important system, is how we actually make sure our spacecraft works, how we actually make sure the things on board are powered. So the learning outcomes for this section of the course are for you to be able to describe some of the key features and the basic operational principles of, of some important power systems that we use, more ways we use to generate power on spacecraft. Um, and also to be able to do some basic analytical sizing of some of these. So when it comes to you doing your design module next year, you'll be able to size some of the, the power systems to be able to estimate how much mass and how much power is required. Um, and also, as part of your coursework as well, you'll be looking at how you identify um, suitable power sources for different mission requirements. Okay, so how the, the type of power source might impact, or the, the mission requirements might impact the type of power source that you use. Okay, so first of all today we'll look at power system architecture and we'll go through some of the primary power sources, how we actually get power on board our spacecraft. Um, we'll, tomorrow we'll look at a few more, sorry, on Thursday we'll look at a few more uh, different power sources and then we'll look at power storage and also how we do some sizing calculations, how we estimate the size. Okay, so to get started, um, this is a basic sort of block diagram of what electrical power system looks like. So we've got um, our, our main thing is our electrical power system, and then we've got four blocks underneath that. We've got to have some sort of power source, okay? some way to get power, uh, some way to store that, to store energy, okay? because we might not always have the power that we need, so we may be able to we may need to store it at some parts of our mission. And then we need some way to distribute that power to all of our subsystems that need it. So to our propulsion, to our attitude determination, to our communications, all of these things that require power on board the satellite to work. We need some way to get that power from our, whatever our power storage is to all of those systems. And then there has to be some way to control that because do you think that all of those systems are going to operate at the same power levels? No? At the same voltages? Possibly not. Okay, so some systems, particularly maybe electric propulsion, you might need to have quite high voltages if you're, if you're generating thrust using electrostatic fields. You may need to increase the voltage somewhere. Some systems, may, you may need to decrease the voltage. You have to have some way to control that, to make sure that the, the power levels and the power requirements are met for each of the subsystems. Okay, so here's a, an example for a, a typical power system, which is a solar array. You've got, um, in that primary power source, you've got your solar array. Why do you think we need a, a secondary, or a, we call it secondary here, or, or your energy storage? Why, why do you think that might be necessary? Yep? Redundancies. Redundancy? Okay. Say your main power source is Kongsat. 
Yep. You, if you don't have a secondary storage, you could be left with nothing. Okay, yeah, so power is very important, so it's good to have that secondary. Why do you think for solar arrays that might be particularly important? Yep. Don't get any power from when we're in eclipse. Yep, exactly. So, so if we enter into the eclipse region, suddenly we've got no power. And our battery is starting, is becoming our primary power source because it's got, we've charged it up during the time when we're in sunlight. So it's particularly important for low Earth orbits where you're in eclipse for potentially quite a large period of the orbit. Okay, so it's really, really critical. Uh, if you're further out, then the part of the orbit gets smaller and smaller that you're in eclipse, but it's still quite, quite critical to be able to have power during that period in order to be able to keep things going. Okay, because that might be when you're doing some sort of communication, so you, might, you may need that. Uh, but just think about kind of what you might be doing when you've got that. But shutting down all the systems on board a satellite just going through eclipse might not be viable, or pretty much not viable, because things, things will stop working. Okay, and then you've got, you can see, in that kind of control bit, you've got some sort of uh, shunt regulator. That controls the, the kind of voltages in the system. So it's, you've got some sort of way of controlling the different voltages to things. You've got some way to control the charging of the battery and some way to control the discharge of the battery so that you don't, discharge, you don't charge up the battery too rapidly and you don't discharge the battery too, too quickly because that can affect the battery lifetime. Okay, and then you've got uh, your batteries, which are your secondary, and then on top of that, all of the spacecraft loads. So anything that's going to draw power from that power system is on top of that. It's all um, pulling out the power from there. So any questions around that? We're fairly happy with that. Fairly straightforward. Okay, so how do we get one of the potentially types of power sources that we might have? Okay, photovoltaic is one. You're probably all familiar with that. Yeah, so it's basically just a solar array, and we'll, we'll look in a little bit about how we actually how solar arrays actually generate electricity, because one of, they're one of the most prolific power sources, power, power raising systems for satellites. So it's quite important for you to understand a little bit. You don't need to know all of the sort of great detail, but just to understand the basics of how they operate. Um, so oh, they shouldn't have come up together, but we've got solar dynamic. Ignore the, set, the third line. The solar dynamic, that's using something like a, a Stirling engine, some sort of closed cycle system to heat up a fluid using the solar energy, and that pushes it around, and that generates power because you're, you're generating kinetic energy, and you can convert that into electrical energy. Okay? Not very common, not used very often. But some of the early lunar systems did use them, and there are some examples of, of some solar dynamic systems that are in place. Um, so RTG, of my, my thing, the slides are a little bit out of sync here, but the radioisotope thermal generator, that is quite common. Where do you think that might be used? We've got a question later on, but yeah. Interplanetary missions, say if you wanted to send something out to Mars. Okay, yeah, so, so Mars, you may still get away with using solar power because it's still relatively close to the sun, but it's used... But it's, but it's less than Earth. Yeah, so it's, it's much less than Earth, and, and so your, your energy that you get from the sun is dissipating over a bigger area, so that means you're actually collecting less energy for your given area of your solar panel as you get further away. If you imagine it's the, that R-squared law, if you get further and further and further away, it's, it's dissipating over a, a bigger surface area. Also, yep. deep space missions work for uh, radioisotope thermal generators. Yes, exactly. So, so, so anywhere where you're really going. So what, what satellites in orbit now or kind of going out of our solar system or exiting our solar system are you aware of that may, may use this? Voyager. Voyager, yeah. yeah. And Pioneer, yeah, yeah. So the very early satellites from the 60s and the 70s that were launched, and there was two missions, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and then there was Pioneer as well. They were launched to go out of our solar system, and I think um, Voyager 2 had just left a couple of years ago, and they still were receiving signal back. So the power system was still working on board, and because it was going so far away, further away from the sun, it wasn't going to use, be able to use solar power um, for, for the entirety of its mission, so they had to think of another source. Uh, sometimes lunar missions also use RTGs, so some of the early lunar missions, there are some RTGs still on the surface of the moon that were used during those. Missions, 
And that's because perhaps they were going into shadow region or they were kind of operating in regions where they needed a bit more um, constant. Uh, fuel cells are another one. So fuel cells used quite readily on the ISS. Okay, so we'll look at those in more detail maybe on Thursday. I think we will get around to them. And then there are a few others, chemical, dynamic, nuclear, and batteries. I put batteries as a primary. It could be a primary if your mission was really, really short. Okay, so if your mission was a couple of hours or a couple of days, you might get away with just using a battery. So very early missions, they did that. But generally, we call, we call batteries our <laughs> secondary source. They're our energy storage. So we've got secondary, store, secondary sources are the primary type of, of secondary source. The principal type is our batteries. But you could also store energy in a flywheel. Okay, so you could, when, you're, when your um, solar array is getting energy or your primary source is getting energy from the sun, you can then store that in the kinetic energy of a flywheel. So keep the flywheel moving around. And then you can take that energy out of the flywheel and use and convert it back into electrical power. What do you think might be a disadvantage of doing that? Over a battery, sorry, say. Yep. The flywheel makes a lot of hits and they cause massive damage. Okay, yeah, you've got, you've got something quite dynamic in your, in your spacecraft. Um, you might have to manage the, the uh, the momentum in that wheel as well. Oh, so, yeah, so it's balance the it, wheel as well because if it doesn't balance, you can easily, your spacecraft could easily do a dance, or maybe, or maybe we could have that, that yeah. funny thing happen with the wheel breaking off and destroying stuff. So, so there, there are kind of uh, issues around it, but there are sometimes there are potential advantages as well. Depends on the mission, okay? But these are all potential sources, both primary power sources and then our, our secondary. So we don't have that many secondary, potentially just batteries. But we have lots of different types of battery chemistry that we can look at that have different performances. So we need to think about that. And there's new battery technology coming online in the future that, you, um, that may be relevant. Okay, any questions about that? We're fairly happy, okay. Okay, so... Here's another mentee. How was the first artificial satellite? So anyone recognize this is Sputnik? Okay, doesn't look like it's got solar rays, so that's a, that's a hint there. How do you think that first artificial satellite was powered? Hmm? So this was uh, a first test satellite, it was a very short mission. Okay, initially planned for a couple of days, yep. Um, so if you want to stick your answers up on Menti, yep, happy to, but <laughs> you may have revealed the answer or not, so I will. Hopefully that one should work. Okay, see if we can get this out. Okay. Okay, so we've got a few answers there. Um, some of you, you're kind of undecided between fuel cell and battery. Some of you said RTG. Uh, a few of you said uh, um, photovoltaic. So if you look at the sort of geometry of the satellite, it could put loads of little solar panels on there, solar arrays on there, but it, it was a bit challenging in the early days. So you do, you do see some spherical satellites with solar panels on, but typically the solar panels tend to be pretty much flat, big arrays that then point to the sun. Um, sometimes you get cylindrical satellites with solar arrays kind of all around the, the outside, and we'll look at that when we look at attitude determination and control, why you might want to do it that way. Uh, but typically, if you've got a kind of spherical satellite like that, it's probably not got uh, solar power. Um, so some of you said, a few of you said RTGs. Um, I think in the early days they didn't really have the RTG kind of uh, uh, systems weren't that kind of advanced. But also, usually RTGs have some way of kind of dissipating some of the heat. And they're usually stuck out on a limb somewhere quite far away from the satellite because they cause a lot of interference with electrical components on board the satellite. They can do, cause damage and 
um, cause issues with that. So you want to have the power available, but then bring the power back through a cable in, into the satellite itself. So you'll usually see um, if it's RTG powered, it's going to have some sort of big boom with the RTG kind of stuck on, on the way uh, further away. So fuel cells and uh, battery are pretty good options. Fuel cells tend to be quite large. Um, so, so you can kind of condense batteries. This, this satellite was about yay big, okay, so quite, quite a small satellite. Um, so uh, actually was powered by silver zinc batteries, I think. Uh, so yeah, that's it, the slide there. So silver zinc batteries were in the middle there. Um, initially only supposed to power it for a couple of days. I think it actually worked for about 22 days in, the, in its, um, so they basically over it. But Pretty much everything when you do for space is you overspec it because you have you have to be confident it's going to work. So you you're kind of making sure very much that you've you've got the, the, the systems required. Okay, so get rid of that. Okay, any questions around that? Yeah. Why doesn't the left screen work? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm putting left screen for Menti. The controller for the screens doesn't work at the moment, so I have to use this matrix controller, and it's a bit clunky to work. So, Can you all see the, the right screen okay? You're all happy with that? Yeah. We'll continue that way if that's all right, because I don't want to disrupt what's actually working. <laughs> um, so, so we go. Well, have we got any questions about, uh, um, about Sputnik? Anything like that? Okay. All right. So... Thinking about to the mission operations, we talked about that, what, when we might use uh, different sources of, of power and what the op operational envelopes are. So if we think, uh, if we look on the y-axis, we've got um, the, the electrical power in kilowatts, okay? And on the x-axis, we've got mission time. So we can look at what types of mission, how long our missions might be, what types of power technology might be relevant. And down in this, this corner here, we've got relatively low electrical power, um, we've got kind of shortish mission time. Batteries tend to be quite a good, quite a suitable um, power source, okay? Anything up to a day, even up to possibly a week, it could be, they could be viable, okay? Depending on what your mission, what you're trying to do. So Sputnik was what we, that, that mission that we looked at a minute ago, was a very basic satellite. All, it, all they wanted to do was send it up into orbit and see if they could receive a signal. So it just beeped down. There were lots of people, obviously the, uh, the Russians who sent it into orbit, they, they knew the signal and they knew where it was going to be, and so they were tracking it. But there were lots of people around the world that suddenly heard this beep from space and they were like, what is that? And they realized that somebody had launched a satellite into orbit and they, were, they could track that signal. Okay, so, so it's, communications is global in the satellites, so you're able to, but if you're sending complex com signals, you might not be able to decode what that signal is. Okay, but you, you'll still be able to pick that signal up around the world. But batteries tend to kind of be relevant in these relatively lowish power up to about maybe a kilowatt. Um, anything beyond that, I think you're starting to push what's, what's feasible with a battery. Uh, then you want to, if you want to go into sort of higher power, longer missions, you might want to have fuel cells, okay? So they're a bit like batteries, they're, but they're using um, water and they're doing ele high, um, electrolysis to generate that electricity and, and generate um, the power that we need. Okay, so you can top them up. You can um, add more if you need to, but you need to have access to them to be able to do that. So they're, they're again, a, a not a renewable in many sense of the word power system. So, so they'll, they'll go on for maybe a couple of weeks um, and they'll give you sort of relatively high-ish up to maybe a tens of kilowatts um, of power. So if you've got a slightly higher communications satellite, maybe power-hungry satellite, they might want to use that, but only if it was a very short duration. So think about what types of missions that might use. Or if you could have access to that fuel cell and do things with it. So the ISS, International Space Station, uses fuel cells um, on board because you've got water as a byproduct of that process, so it's quite useful for the astronauts. 
um, and they can then top it off. But if you want any sort of reasonable length in your mission um, and you want sort of reasonable power levels for kilowatts and you're in Earth orbit, then you might go for photovoltaic or if you're in even closer to the sun, so if you're in Mercury or Venus, then <coughs> equally very, very useful, um, uh, even better in Mercury and Venus's orbits because you get even higher power, power back. But if you're anything further out than Mars, say, you probably want to go for an RTG. So that's that radioisotope thermal generator. So that's using radioactive decay, the heat output from radioactive decay to convert that into electrical energy using these um, thermal generators. Okay, and then beyond that we've got all sorts of other, these other technologies, but these, this sort of region here that's all kind of in colour is probably the, the types of missions, the, the types of power profiles and missions that you've really come across. The other things are a bit more exotic if you need very, very high power um, or for a very short duration or if you need very, very high power for very long duration, you might need to go to some, some sort of more exotic systems. But that would probably only be if you're doing something um, like trying to sustain human life for a very, very long duration mission, and you're far away from the sun or something like that. So, so there's very kind of unique missions that you would maybe want to use different, these different technologies. But principally, batteries, fuel cells, um, and uh, photovoltaic or RTGs are the main power sources you would see in most, most satellites. Have we got any questions? Right now, yep. Can I ask why batteries is only like one day when it's like 22 days? Uh, so that's a logarithmic scale. So it's one day up to kind of a couple of days. But, so but it's less than a week. It's a bit more than a week. Uh, yeah, so, so generally, I mean, as you get lower and lower, as you're kind of using up your battery power, then you're getting more, kind of more and more um, into a danger zone that your systems will start shutting down, you won't be able to operate. So, so it's a, a sort of high risk to operate for a long period of time with a battery. Uh, so these are operational envelopes for no risk operation? For, for well, um, ideally when you're designing a satellite, you, you're kind of not designing it to be operating in a very risk environment condition where, where things might start shutting down. Yeah, so as, as battery technology kind of improves, you may be able to push that envelope beyond up to a week or a month, um, and even up to, as Sputnik did, up to 22 days. So, so it, it was operating, but they didn't know that it would, okay? So, so they, they didn't have the confidence that your battery is going through thermal cycles, okay? So it's being heated up and cooled down as it goes through the, the, the being in the sunlight and going out of the sunlight, so that might have an effect there were lots of unknowns about the operation that they didn't, didn't know at that time. And even now, there are lots of unknowns about operations of, these, of batteries or things that we can't foresee. So, the, so it's best to be conservative and say, okay, for that period. Also, you don't really want to, with your mobile phone, how many of you get, move your, let, let your battery get down to sort of 10, 15% regularly? <laughs> You do all the time, okay. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Yeah, it depends on the, on the uh, battery chemistry, but for most batteries it's probably not a good idea. It just, it, it, um, if you want to recharge those batteries, certainly for rechargeable batteries, you get, you get lower kind of performance out of them over their, their period. If you're not trying to recharge it, that's fine, but your performance does <coughs> tend to drop off in the battery as you get sort of lower and it's in its capacity. So, so it's better to kind of um, use batteries wisely, okay, and only for short, short periods, short duration. But as I say, as a caveat, as technology moves on, we may be able to have batteries that last longer. And so that, that bottom line could move into the, up to the month. Okay, any, any other questions? Or happy to move on? Okay. Okay, so looking at primary power systems, we can start to look at the performance. So solar array, we can get, um, so currently with current technologies or sort of, um, and even some emergent technologies, we can get up to 0.2 to 25 kilowatts 
Um, specific power is reasonably good, and uh, the cost is reasonably okay. So they, they're quite a common um, source of power. And be, because uh, it's renewable, effectively, then we can use them for very long duration missions. There are things that influence the performance of solar arrays over time, and we'll look at that in a bit. But generally, they should operate kind of for extended periods of time. So for very long missions, 15, 20 years, you may still have solar arrays operating effectively over that period. Uh, solar dynamic, um, much higher power ranges potentially. Um, a bit lower in your uh, power per kilo. Okay, so you're not getting as much power for the amount of, um, because you need to kind of have all systems on board, like bearings and things, all, all sorts of other um, mechanical components that you wouldn't necessarily have with just um, an electrical or a chemical battery system. So, so, but their specific cost, um, the cost per watt is a bit lower, so that's, that's potentially good. Uh, RTGs. Moderate levels of power, so up to about 10 kilowatts, which is reasonable to, to power pretty much a, a, a communication satellite, sort of long range systems as well. Um, specific power, okay, it's uh, reasonable, it's on par with solar dynamic. You've got to have all sorts of cooling fins, and, and also remember you've got to mount that RTG a little bit away from all of your systems, so you've got to have some sort of boom. So that's kind of considering all of those extra bits of mass that you might need in order to make an RTG actually work on board a satellite. Oh, sorry. But you can see the specific cost is pretty high, okay? So there's not many sources of the radioisotopes that you would use to generate this, and they're quite difficult to process and get. So the costs become a little bit phenomenal. Nuclear, pretty reasonable, okay? Um, good, quite good power ranges, so then again, if you're trying to power very high, heavy, high power requirements. That would be quite useful. Um, the specific power, pretty good. Specific cost, really good. Okay, so if you could develop a nuclear system on board, that would be quite good. But again, this probably, in order to get to the point where you've got a system that, that's kind of at around $500 per watt, you probably have to put a lot of development into it. So there's the upfront development cost to actually get to that point as well we have to think about. So arrays are pretty much all quite kind of in the forefront of development. And um, terrestrial technologies are using them as well. So we can lend from the innovations and terrestrial technologies. You can do the same with nuclear, but the, the transfer from uh, terrestrial kind of technology world from nuclear uh, into space nuclear is quite different from just transferring uh, uh, terrestrial solar into space solar. Then we've got fuel cells as well. So again, power ranges up to maybe hundreds of kilowatts, so quite, quite good in that, uh, in that range. Specific power, again, pretty much on par with solar, solar arrays, so a good alternative potentially, and pretty low, okay? Pretty low specific cost. So you've got only $100 per, per watt which may be a kind of an incentive to think about that. So, so it's all worth understanding what that landscape looks like in terms of how you might design your satellite, what, what power source you might, you might choose. Okay, ignore that diagram at the bottom. <laughs> that will come in a minute. But, um, so, sorry, have we got any questions around that first before we move on? <laughs> We're all fairly happy with that. We've got a question, yep. Yep. Okay, so that, that's a very valid question. Let's think about when we go away from the sun, as we said before, we're, we're kind of less, l l there's no energy coming to our satellite, so we have to basically bring a sun with us, bring the energy with us. And the only kind of source that, that supplies energy all the time is this radioactive decay. Okay, so, so that's the only way for deep space missions or for missions that are very far away from the sun that can't gather enough energy from the sun to, to, have, to, to generate that power effectively, um, that, that's the only way those sort of missions will operate. So it's, it's really for very deep space missions or for missions that are going to operate in regions where you've not got any access to sunlight. So it could be um, on board the, on, on the moon, uh, there's these things called lunar larva tubes, which are proposed as, as good landing sites and good sites 
for uh, future habitation on the moon, because they have a nice protective cover, but also interesting scientifically. If you wanted to operate in those, you'd have to have some sort of power source that could be separated from the sun. You're not requiring energy from the sun in order to generate power. Okay, any other questions? We're very happy with that. Okay, so how do solar arrays work? Uh, so solar arrays use semiconductors, and semiconductors in themselves, so silicon, is not uh, conduct, like doesn't conduct. You need to, it's a pure, uh, pure silicon is an insulator, okay? So you need to do something to it, and we call it doping, um, to allow, so doping is adding a chemical into that, into the structure of the silicon, in order to allow you to free an electron, or create an electron hole, okay? So if you free an electron, you've created um, a, what we call an N-type semiconductor. So, oops, my laser pointed. And that has an excess electron. And if you create a hole, okay, deficit of electron, you have a P-type. So it's just N for negative and P for positive, okay? And if you look at what an N, a P-type looks like, sorry, that's uh, if we dope silicon with boron, We've got three electrons, and basically we create in the structure an electron hole, okay? So in that structure of that um, molecule that we've created, this a silicon with a boron collect connected to it, we've got a hole in there that that's, would accept an electron into it if an electron came, okay? If we add, so um, something like, in this case, so ignore the... Uh, the symbol in there, but antimony uh, also gives f has five electrons. Okay, so it will give a free electron to that molecule. Okay, so there's will be a free electron associated with that molecule that, if we put it in a structure, will allow conduction. So that free electron could actually move from this n-type to this p-type, to so move from the hole, uh, from being free to the hole, and actually then conduct electricity. But in order to do that, it has to go from what we call this valence band to the conduction band. So it has to have enough energy to get there. So where do you think we get the energy from? If it doesn't have enough energy in its, in its native state, just sitting there, how, where would the energy come from? Yep. Yeah. So, so if you've got um, photons, hitting that, that surface, some of, that en some of the photon energy may interact, so the photons may interact with the molecule and allow an electron to get enough energy to jump into this conduction band. Yep, so if you, if you excite it enough, then it will do that. Um, but what we have here is, is this energy gap, and we have to overcome it. So we have to put energy into the system, and we call it a band gap as well. So, um, the, the reason why it's banned is because these behave like quant quantum effects. So they have to have enough energy to be able to, to jump that. It's not, it's not analog. It has to happen in packets. Okay? So we have these energies sitting in different energy levels in bands around our atom, around our molecule. Um, and if we give them enough energy, they'll be able to jump into this conduction band. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, we're happy with that? Okay. So if we've got our PN junction then, we've got our positive type and our negative type. So we've got our positive type has these holes, our negative type has a lot excess of electrons, and we push them together, they create... <coughs> I don't know, the computer's telling me something. <laughs> they create this region uh, called, uh, called a kind of diffusion region where some of the electrons from the n-type diffuse into this p-type. And we get a little electric field here in this region. And this is what we need in order to have a, this solar array, in order to have this, we need what we call a p-n junction, okay? And we have this, so it's called a depletion layer. So it's a region where you get this kind of electric field going across it, and you've got some electrons from the negative type that fill some of the holes. And this is ready now, it's, it's primed to then not sure why it keeps calling me, but this, this region is primed now to allow you, if you have, you put energy into it, it, some of those electrons 
will then start conducting, moving around the system. In order to do that, we need to, as I say, put some light in. So if we put a, a wire between our n-type and our p-type, we put a little bit of light on, that actually allows the electron to move through the wire. Okay, so the electrons are moving in this direction. Sign convention means if our electrons move in one direction, our current is in the opposite direction. Okay, so current is just the positive current is just in the opposite direction to the motion of movement of electron in the direction, and this allows then our um, our, our junction, our p-n junction, to generate electricity. Okay, so this is how it, you effectually get this current flowing through the system. So the, it's not getting energy, it's not doing it, it's not disobeying the laws of thermodynamics, it's not generating energy for nothing. Okay, you've got some energy coming into the system in terms of your photons that are adding energy to your electron and allow it to go into this conduction band and allow it to go through the circuit. Does that make sense? Relatively? We're happy with that? Okay, good. Uh, so this is what happens. So you've got an idea, your incident photon comes in um, and you've got something in the valence band. It allows this, your, your electron to jump up, get, that's got that energy now, jumps up into the conduction band. If you've got just enough energy, that's brilliant. Okay, so just enough to overcome that band gap, overcome that energy gap, it will jump up without cr producing any other effects. Okay, so all that energy will be taken, all that energy from the photon will be taken by that electron, allow that electron to jump into the conduction band and it will go and conduct electricity around your circuit. If there's too much, it outputs some of that energy as heat. Okay, so some of it's going to then dissipate into your, into your satellite and generate heat in the satellite, so it's going to heat it up. And so then we have, you've done that last week, how we need to control the temperature of the satellite. We might need to have some cooling, some way to remove that heat if it's not required there. Okay, so, it's, so we have to think about what um, sort of, of um, light is going to fall on our solar array and how we're going to manage that thermal kind of that heat that we don't need, necessarily. An array is basically just um, a whole load of these junctions, these PN junctions, wired together so that you have sort of continuous um, loop kind of circuit that goes right through. So you wire the P-type to the N-type all the way around, and you create a circuit in series. Okay, so your, your current is going through P-type to N-type, P-type to N-type, all the way through. Yeah. What might be a disadvantage of, of having a circuit in series like that? What happens if I've got another one here and then I knock that out? That's not working anymore. Something hits it. What's going to happen to it? It's going to stop. Yeah, you're going to create a break in the circuit. So. Um, if you've got, if you wire lights, it's very similar. If you wire lights in, in series, so anyone familiar with old Christmas tree lights that used to be wired up in series, okay, if, you, if one was not working, you have to go through all of the whole row of lights in order to find which one was not working. If you wire it up, what's the other way we could wire this up? Yep. In parallel, okay. Yeah, so if we wire it in parallel, that means that that light that or that array, or that PN junction that's not working, just gets kind of bypassed, okay? So, so it doesn't work still, but it doesn't stop all of the other, the, the circuit, external circuit flowing. And so that makes it a little bit more redundant, robust, yep? How do we get back from the balance to the conduction band? How do you get back? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to get back. <laughs> so, so, so you want to put a bit of energy in so your electron jumps up in, into that band. So, so that you, your, it, your electron has enough energy to get into the conduction band. Yeah? So it's, it's not, you don't want the electron to get back down. It's, it's, um, so that's, that's a good point, is uh, PN junctions and, and these sort of junctions, they're called diodes. So what, do we know what a diode means in an electrical circuit? Yep. Basically, the electrical version of a check valve, it's got far more resistance in one direction yeah, okay, so the flow of the current only goes one way. 
pretty much. It only goes one way yeah. unless, unless, you, <coughs> unless you do something really wrong with it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so well, all, all of these uh, junctions are going to act like diodes. They're going to act to allow the current only to go in one direction, yeah. So we only have that. that. But it's a very good question. Mary points that out. But we only have the current flowing in one direction around the circuit, yeah. And it'll only flow through, through that from that P type to N type. Okay, so we have, uh, familiar with this diagram from last week, yeah? So this is what our, our kind of, um, the energy from the sun looks like, the solar spectrum, um, in wavelength. So the peak of it is invisible light. So that's probably where most of our, we want our solar rays to be operating, okay? So that's where um, most of these will. So the energy gap is um, inversely, so the photon in, uh, energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So as we get shorter wavelengths, we get more energy. Yeah? So these longer wavelengths into infrared, they're going to give us less energy per photon. Uh, these shorter wavelengths into the ultraviolet are going to give us more. Okay? We said that band gap, we want to have enough energy for electrons to jump that band gap. Ideally, not too much, because that, then that, that extra energy is just going to be dissipated as heat in the system. So we have to deal with that somehow. So if we look at the different energy gaps, silicon, oops, uh, see not, yeah. silicon has an energy gap of 1.12 electron volts, which kind of fortuitously <laughs> um, is, is or kind of um, relates to the maximum wavelength that we can actually use in silicon is 1.12. Uh, microns, okay? So, so it, it just happens to, to overlap like that. So, so don't read anything into it other than the fact that the numbers are, are the same. Okay? Uh, so that's silicon. And we can use anything, any, any wavelength which has, uh, which is lower wavelength than this will give us enough energy in order to generate, uh, allow the electrons to jump for, into that conduction band. And so anything beyond that in that infrared region, we won't get enough energy from those photons in order to be able to do that. Okay, so it will just pass through. It may, it may heat up the material, but it will generally just pass through without generating. It won't interact with the electron to give it enough energy to jump that. So it has to have a lower wavelength than 1.12 in order to do that. For gallium arsenide, um, it has to have a lower wavelength than 0.92, so even, even more restricted than the silicon. Okay. So we can see the different technologies, um, gallium phosphorus, ga um, cadmium telluride, the different wavelengths. So actually silicon gives us the, the kind of longest region, widest region of wavelengths that we can operate. Um, so silicon tends to be the most commonly used, but then um, after that, gallium arsenide. So if you look at different technologies for, for photovoltaics, you'll see. Okay. Um, so also we have to, to manage the power. Okay, so sorry, do we have any questions around that? We're kind of all relatively happy with that. Yeah? Okay. So um, if we look at how we get our voltage, um, go back to Ohm's law. You've done this before in, in your first year um, electrical, yeah? Yes. So you're familiar with voltage is equal to current times resistance, and our power is equal to current times voltage, okay? So if we've got a, a power voltage curve like this, okay, at short circuit, so a short circuit where, our two, where we've got basically no load on our circuit, okay? We've, we've connected our circuit and it's got two wires. So imagine that spacecraft load diagram at the beginning and it just had a wire connected to it. That's where we get our maximum current at the minimum voltage, okay? So it's pushing everything through very, very easily. Okay, there's no resistance to it. At open circuit, where we've got two wires that are completely open, so our resistance between it and our circuit is very, very high, that's where we're going to get our maximum voltage and the current is going to be very, very low. Okay, so that's what it will look like. So we need to manage that current voltage power profile. And we can see, so power is equal to current times voltage. If we, if we draw a power profile for that, we get some region, some point here, where we're going to have peak power. 
And we want to make sure our satellite is always operating at this point. So that's what that kind of power distribution and power management is all about. <coughs> yep. <coughs> yep. Uh, wouldn't it be far better for you to, to, uh, <coughs> to use it at the intersection point? So to use it, at, well, we want to operate kind of around here. Or we're always operating peak power. But yeah. Thing kind of, but look at how it breaks down. Ah, so, so they're not, it's not an intersection. It's like that's the power curve, and that's the current um, voltage yeah, curve. Z but, Z yeah. So the point, if we look, well, where do we get maximum power is when we operate kind of at this point here. And where is that um, in, our, in our sort of voltage and circuit point? Yep. So, so no matter what, we operate at max power. Well, we want to keep the system around, operating around peak power. Okay? It, might, it may be advantageous sometimes to operate slightly lower or slightly higher than that. But ideally, you want to be operating around about peak, keeping the loads managed around about peak power so, so that you're getting the most out of your system. Yep. Uh, but as you increase the illumination, uh, then you start to get higher voltages and higher power, clearly. Okay? So you, you still got to manage that. So your, your illumination is going to change as you go around through your orbit, so you've also got to manage how that works. So, so you've got to have some sort of power system, and we wouldn't expect you to be designing all of that. You're thinking about that needs to be built into the, the design of the power system, but it is built into the design of any solar array power system. So there, there are technologies you can get out there that will do all of that peak power management and make sure your system is always operating around that. So basically what it does is it adds extra load so that you don't get into this open circuit zone here, but equally you don't want to have lo too much load, so you're kind of operating in this, this short circuit here as well. So it's, it's managing those. We've got these shunt resistors that allow you to manage that and, and always keep you operating in this peak power. So as I said, yeah, the, the peak power, um, the point is changing as you're changing your illumination as well. So there's, there's something on board the system that, that needs to manage that. Um, you also have an effect. So have we got any questions around that before we move on? Are we kind of happy with that? Just how we, how we manage the, the spacecraft power. Now we've got a few minutes left. So I can talk about the temperature effect. So not only does uh, illumination have an influence, but also as your solar rays get hotter or colder, that also influences the sort of maximum the current and the voltage that you'll output. So it need, you need to manage that as well. That will change the performance of the solar array. You need to have some systems on board to be, be um, able to, to manage that, those sort of changes in power. Um, so one thing that happens is as you exit eclipse, you suddenly get a power surge. Okay, so you, in the eclipse region, you're operating cold and you've got no power. You go into the uh, you go into the sun region. You've suddenly got power on board. Okay, so you've got to manage that. In the eclipse region, you are probably depleting your battery power, and then suddenly you're going, going into a sunlight region where you've got a bit of a power surge, and the power system has to be able to cope with that so that it doesn't short out some of your, your sensitive equipment. So it's got to have a way to manage sudden increases in power in the system. Uh, the sun has an effect as well. So as remember, I said at the beginning, um, the Sputnik is a spherical surface. And if you had um, a spherical surface covered in solar arrays, then you're going to have different angles that the sun is hitting it. The sun vector is going to be different for um, that whole surface. And it's going to become inefficient or lower at certain points. So you want to be able to manage that. Okay, so, um, but ideally, you would have a flat array that would point normal to the sun. And you may, may want to have to orientate that. So your array might have to have motors that will orientate themselves throughout the mission, throughout the orbit, in order to keep that maximum angle between the sun um, and, and the, the solar array. Radiation has an influence as well. So remember at the beginning, we talked about the different forms of, of radiation in the, in the upper atmosphere. And that's our kind of, our magnetosphere is not protecting us from, from all of them. So, so that some of the uh, high energy protons and electrons that get through in our upper atmosphere um, will degrade the performance of the solar array over time. So beginning of life, BOL, 
is what the, the solar array might produce right at the start of its mission. And then, say, maybe 10, 15 years into the mission, you'll have its end of life, and that's what its performance will be. So when you're sizing a solar array to do the mission throughout the mission, you need to make sure you size it based on its performance at the end of its mission lifetime. So you need to look at how is that solar array going to degrade. So things that can cause degradation or make it the, the solar arrays are covered in some sort of glass. And over time, that might get eroded. Atomic oxygen has an effect as well. It might make the surfaces no longer as transparent. They might become slightly more opaque. And so um, the same amount of solar energy is not going to be able to get through. Um, so all of that's going to influence the performance and you're going to have to look at, well, what's the performance likely to be after it's been exposed to this environment for a long period of time? Um, so this is an example, and we'll leave you with that. We'll go on to look at different technologies next uh, time on Thursday. But this is an example of different uh, solar cell materials and their performance. And you can see the sort of radiation effects vary depending on the technology but also the efficiency varies depending on technology. The highest efficiencies, uh, these are theoretical, um, tend to be for these gallium arsenide. There are in e newer technologies coming on board, thin film solar technologies, uh, thin film arrays that use um, other um, kind of materials that may have slightly higher performance. But typically the highest performance you can get for satellite systems is around about 23, 25%. Okay, there are some that are aching up to 30%. Do you think that that's... Okay, they can get 30% of the energy that's coming into them. Where does the rest of that go? Where does the rest of that energy that's falling on that solar array go? Heat. Yeah, so we've got to manage that heat somehow. So that's what you learned about last week. So, so thinking about what happens to all of this energy, how we convert it. Not only once we've converted it into electrical energy and put it around our satellites, and empowered all the systems, some of those systems are acting inefficiently and producing heat. So we've got to manage all of those internal heat sources as well as that external thing that's heat hitting the surface. So, so thermal and power, if you're using solar arrays or even other technologies, are quite interlinked and you've got to think about that performance. But I'll leave you with that and we'll look at other technologies. Um, a little, we'll look a little bit more about solar arrays and other technologies on Thursday. Okay, no worries. It's, it stayed fine for the rest of the time, yeah. yeah it's, uh, I think it's probably just like cable. Yeah, it's I guess it's probably had quite a bit of use.